Welcome to the Way Up Podcast. I'm Jeff Knoll, your host. Today, I have an extraordinary guest, Davin Michaels. Davin's an entrepreneur since the age of 15 years old. He's worked with top musicians, started successful businesses, and pioneered a massive outsourcing empire. Despite the ups and downs, he's a New York Times best-selling author. Join us as we dive into his inspiring journey. The Way Up Podcast is sponsored by me. I'm a real estate broker in the state of Missouri, and I believe that this message is worth my investment. Hang with us till the end. I know you won't be disappointed. I am extremely excited to be here today with my new friend, Davin Michaels. I haven't met him in person, but he is with us from Palmas Del Mar, Puerto Rico. Is that correct? That's right. Fantastic. Well, hey, man, why don't you just share a little bit about who you are, um, the the businesses that you have started and kind of what you've done and a little bit of like personal information about you? Okay, sure. Well, uh, so I'm Gavin Michaels. I'm a New York Times bestselling author, 30 year business veteran, and uh, been self employed almost all of my adult life. Started my first business at 15. I have a pretty incredible story. And I I used to think like, you know, it, that was special, but I think all entrepreneurs have, a, have in, incredible stories, right? I, it, it's certainly not easy. But um, I started my first business when I was 15. Um, didn't really. Uh, know what the heck I was doing. I was designing clothing for music groups. My bands had nothing going on, uh, but an amazing thing happened. Uh, MTV came on the air, changed the face of music, changed my life. And uh, I was working with these bands that had nothing going on within about 90 days. They had Most of my bands had record deals within about a year. They were selling millions of albums and I rode that wave and I was designing clothing for all the biggest bands of the 80s and 90s. Um, from there, I uh, had a telecommunications company. I had a pretty cool exit, sold to a public company and took back stock in that deal. Uh, that moment in time changed my life. Um, for many years, I was the biggest EDM event producer in the US. I used to do parties for 15 to 20,000 people a night. How'd you like to be on my guest list? And uh, because of that, my little puppy's here too. Say hi, Penny. And uh, because of that built-in fan base, I had a short career as a recording artist, pretty long career as a music and television producer. I uh, worked with some of the biggest bands in the world. And um, and then I started a little company 15 years ago um, in Asia, um, a company called 123 Employee. We did uh, outsourcing uh, for entrepreneurs. That's a whole long story. We could talk more about that. Um, but um, today we have thousands of employees globally. And um, and uh, what I what I loved about that is I. I'm an entertainer and I spoke all over the globe for the last decade on that. Um, uh, wrote 10 books. My 10th book is in the bookstores right now. And um, and so that allowed me to get the entertainment out of me. And I really enjoyed it. Um, one thing I do is I bring my personality into my businesses. So we, we make it fun. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so that's kind of the scoop today. I'm on the board uh, boards of several companies and uh, still travel and speak and write my books. That's awesome. 15 years old, you're designing. Is that when you started designing clothing for bands? Yeah, so I, I actually wasn't a designer. I was the business side of it. Um, but my partner, um, we had a falling out very early on. And uh, so I I had to start doing the designing. So I did the best I could. I had great ideas, but I had a great team. So we were able to bridge that and make it work. Um, and um, yeah, yeah. So uh, my our, it was pretty interesting. So what happened was I graduated high school a couple of years early, uh, not because I was particularly intelligent, but because I was driven. I, I didn't want to be in high school anymore. I didn't like it. And I wanted to get on with my life and start my business. I kind of had a roadmap at a young age. Um, and uh, my parents had other ideas for me. They wanted me to go to college. So we reached an accord and I ended up um, going to a local JC. And if you look at colleges these days, every college has entrepreneur programs, very common. But back then there were none, zero. And I went to a JC and there was a one-year entrepreneurship immersion class that was taught by two veteran um, uh, business guys that had made a ton of money in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And they were retired. And as a give back, these two, two guys that were maverick entrepreneurs taught this one-year immersion in entrepreneurship. 
And these were the first guys, they're really mavericks. They were the first guys to ever put an offer on the on the back of a box of cereal. I mean, just all kinds of cool stuff that they did. And this was just a get back for them. And um, and they I think they thought it was cute that this, you know, 16 year old kid was in their in their college class, you know, and they took me under their wing. And most of what I learned in entrepreneurship, I learned from doing. But they taught me at an early age that it was possible, you know, back at a time when I was so young that, you know, it didn't really seem possible. And so that was the beginning of my business. And like I said, I, you know, I was working with these bands. They had nothing going on. But like I said, MTV came on the air, changed the face of music and changed everything. And, uh, you know, I was, I was designing clothing for Prince, Cindy Lauper, Madonna, Thompson Twins, Duran Duran, lots of big bands. And that was uh, that's how I got started. Well, I've, I've been doing some research on you because before a few days ago, I I didn't know who you were. No offense. Um, there's no offense. tons and tons of extremely successful people in the world. Yeah. And uh, so I was doing some research, listening to some other podcasts you've been on. And it sounds like your parents were very supportive of you growing up. Um, were, your, were your parents entrepreneurs themselves? No, they were the exact opposite. So uh, my mom was a housewife. Um, I was an only child. My dad, uh, worked, he was a company man. He worked for the same company for 40 years, except for one year. Uh, so he never made more than $30,000 a year, except for one year. He made a lot more because he got headhunted from another company or to another company. And that was the year of yes, because I most of the time I heard no, because we didn't have a lot of money. But that was the year of yes. Can I have this? Yes. Can I have this? Yes. My dad was very magnanimous, very generous. He just, you just didn't have the money. Um, but it was interesting. So we never, we, when I say we, my dad never made more than 30,000 um, a year. And that, that was our, you know, that was the household income, but it was a different time back then. You know, I, we, we were, we weren't poor. We were like lower middle and my dad was still able to save money and, and, and make investments and what have you. Um, and he was an unbelievable mentor to me, one of the greatest men I knew. Um, but uh, no, he was a company guy. And so uh, everything I want to do was uncharted territory um, for for them. But they encouraged me to do everything. Uh, they were always there. Um, you know, they, they encouraged me to do everything. Everything's smart, everything stupid. Um, but but they're wonderful people. But I always say I had two, my, my two biggest mentors. I've had a lot of mentors growing up. But my two biggest mentors was my dad and my uncle Mo. Um, very similar to Robert Kiyosaki's rich dad, poor dad. My dad was my poor dad, if if you will. Um, and my uncle Mo was my rich dad. And it was very interesting. They both uh, grew up poor, dirt poor. Um, my dad was like one of, I don't know, 10 or 12, 11 kids, I think. Um, and my uncle Mo was one of 10 kids, son of a junkyard dealer. They, they both grew up poor. My uncle Mo uh, went on to become a prolific Beverly Hills doctor. Um, very famous. And, um, but they were both wonderful in different ways. My dad was a very simple man. He was the type of guy that got up every morning, planted his feet on the ground and was just grateful to be alive. He lived in a state of gratitude before it was in vogue. Uh, and me, I was much more complicated than that, you know? And it, it's funny. I, I always thought that my best attributes were, were the ones I got from my mom, but it was, it wasn't until my dad passed away that I realized how much of him was in me. Um, I actually write an inspirational book series. Um, it's more of a passion project. It's called Lessons from Beyond. It's about the lessons that people who passed away pass on to the living. And uh, so that's what I call lessons from beyond. Um, um, but anyways, um, so my, my, my rich dad, my uncle Mo, uh, when I was 15 years old, um, I was actually working for a company called Bullock's Wilshire, which later became Macy's. You probably know Macy's. And I was, um, I was the youngest assistant manager in, in their history. And I was selling men's clothing and, um, I actually, I enjoyed it. I really took pride in it. I thought that was going to be my life, my career. You know, I was going to climb up the ranks, eventually maybe run, run a, uh, a department store or become a divisional or president of the whole company someday. I, who knows? Um, and then one day my uncle Mo said to me, he said, you need to start your own business. And I was like, what? And he said, uh, yeah. I said, I said, what am I going to do? He said, well, there's wealthy men in Beverly Hills. They don't have time to shop. He's like, you're going to go shopping for them. Then you're going to number all their clothing for them, put it in their closets, and you're going to be like a shopper for them. And I was like, okay. Because I, I did whatever he said without question because he was just the most brilliant sage I ever knew. So I got some business cards printed up. I started doing this. And then that wasn't exactly my my bag. So then later I started designing clothing for music groups. That that was kind of the next way. But 
he started me on my entrepreneurial career. I always say my uncle Mo was responsible for all of the biggest decisions in my life and business. He even chose who my parents were going to be. That's another interesting story. Uh, but anyway, oh, I was adopted. So okay, uh, okay. Now that that makes yeah. I was like, now where is this going? This yeah. is weird. Yeah, he, but, he, okay. He yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. So anyway, so so that's how I got into business. That's killer. Yeah. So you've done all these different things, you have all these different businesses that have scaled and really put you in a position where you can, you can kind of do whatever you want. You're not, yeah, you're not obligated to, to punch a clock or, or do anything, not saying that you're punching a clock, but you're yeah. still involved in your business. Yeah. You still run it. Um, of all of the things that you've done, what, what of those have given you the most passion, um, made you feel the most alive? Yeah, boy, that's an excellent question. There were a few, really. Um, I was the biggest EDM event producer in the US. I love that. I love building these big events and then, you know, working up to the big night and then looking out over an ocean of people and thinking, I did that. You know, that was that was pretty neat. I love that. Um, my outsourcing business, you know, uh, the outsourcing business is a highly commoditized business. There's nothing exciting or glamorous about it, but we actually made outsourcing sexy and, and created a global brand where I was able to do events globally, speak on stages all over the globe, do our own events that were more like um, rock concerts than events. Um, and, and I loved that. It was great. And we, we made such a, a big impact, you know, globally um, that, that was really fun. Um, let's see. I, I, when I was in the music biz, um, I enjoyed producing as well. So um all three of those were were really probably my favorite. Um, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So you have you have these influences in your life, your dad, your uncle, you have um the the rich dad, poor dad of the two. But what has been something that you have faced? through all of your ventures that has kind of shaken you to your core and made you feel like throwing in the towel or like maybe you're not on the right track. Yeah, I remember. So this is pretty interesting. Um, my company is one, two, three employee. Um, and when we started, well, the company took off after many years, there, there were a lot of tipping points in that business. It was a, it was a bumpy road. We can even talk about that uh, if you want, but, um, but eventually it did take off and became a global brand. And uh, we were probably seven or eight years into it when the business was making more money than it was ever making. Um, and I brought on a VP of sales um, and he was a great guy. I mean, I, I loved him. He loved me. He was a wonderful human being and, and absolutely brilliant. Um, but he had some ideas that, that were not right for our business. And initially, our, just the revenue numbers just kept soaring through the roof. But he made some critical mistakes that really um, that that really hurt us. So we went like this straight up, and then bam, we 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 really had some major 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 issues, and it really sucked because you know we were close to a decade into the business, and at that point you don't you have a successful company, you don't think that there's you know something that can can put you out of business that can shake you to the core. But uh, we ended up in a situation that was really, really bad. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell you about it because I, I think there's a lot of learning lessons in this one. So he had an idea that from a sales perspective, from a revenue perspective, was absolutely genius. But from a customer service and culture perspective, if not executed properly, it would be catastrophic. If executed properly, it could be very cool. Okay, so here's the idea. So his idea was, you know, we have a whole customer service team and he said, why don't we route all customer service calls to the sales team first before they go to customer service? So for example, uh, you know, let's say you're having an issue with, uh, I don't know, your service or whatever it may be. Um, great. You know, uh, hey, this is Joseph. Um, I, I'm going to route you through, but just do you have... Two minutes, sure. Um, you know, uh, Jeff, can you kind of tell me right now 
real quick, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing in your business right now? Well, uh, biggest challenge is Legion and XYZ. Okay, great. Well, listen, um, you know, we have some services here. I went to the employer where we can actually help you generate way more leads. Um, I'm going to transfer you to customer service, but would that be of interest to you? I can follow back up with you and we can, we can have a call. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, cool. Um, because every customer service opportunity is a potential sales opportunity, right? I mean, it, it, it really is when you think about that. So from a revenue generating standpoint, great idea because you're generating way more sales leads all day long. And so many businesses are always chasing after their, a new client, right? They're always looking for the new client, but who is your best client? Repeat client. Absolutely. Your best client is your current client. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and so many businesses are always chasing the new client, but it's better to go deeper with your current client because they know, like, and trust you. And it's much easier. There's no barriers there. Right. So, and you understand them. So anyways, so it was a, it was a great idea on paper. Revenue was going up, but what would happen was, you know, the sales team didn't give a shit about customer service. Right. And so they were just trying to make sales. And then when they found that there was an opportunity there or not an opportunity there, they, 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 they weren't really concerned with making sure that customer service issue was handled, right? They were just kind of transferring away and not thinking about it as that. So what ended up happening? Well, 95% of our business uh, came through merchant accounts, through, our, through credit cards. And we had almost a non-existent chargeback rate and refund rate. But all of a sudden, our chargebacks went to 1%. Negligible, but you know you want to keep it in check. Uh, then they go up to 2%. And I, I explained to my guy, I'm like, look, we need to nip this in the bud because we're going to have a problem. 3%. I'm like, we've got to get a hold of this. 4%. I said, we're in trouble. <laughs> okay, we've got to fix this. 5% phone rings, right? So now uh, it's my rep at, um, at PayPal. And I luckily I had a great um, relationship with PayPal, PayPal, PayFlow Pro, which was merchant processing. Um, so I had a rep there and she goes, look, she goes, uh, uh, Risk wants to talk to you. I was like, I was waiting for this call. So we get on the phone with Risk and Risk says, hey, you know, we would have shut down your accounts, but you're, you have a great relationship with your rep and, you know, she she vouched for you. I said, so that's great. They said, we need to put a, a rolling reserve on. So they wanted to put a I believe it was a 20% 90-day uh, rolling reserve. And I said, well, you know, look, on a good day, my profit margin is 90, or it's 20%. I said, I can't, you know, I can't operate on, on zero profit. And they go, well, okay, we're sensitive to that. So they they changed it to like, a, I think it was a 10%, 180-day uh, rolling reserve. But um, during that time, I mean, we went from this insane business to really, I mean, we got in trouble. And by the way, what was happening was, our, when during that time when our revenue numbers were going up, 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 our loyal base that had been with us for so many years that we're not getting good customer service were, were canceling. But we didn't see that because we were just looking at revenue. We weren't looking at customers. So, you know, we... So I the lesson learned there is obviously, you know, you, you don't take your your eye off the ball, right? But there's, there's a lot of balls, <laughs> if you will, because, you know, you'd look at it on the outside and say, well, our revenue numbers were higher than they'd ever been, you know, but we were actually ruining the business. So when that happened, we almost went under, you know, I, I think this was like year seven or eight in the company, which is mind blowing. Um, and so I brought the team together and we figured out a way to come back bigger and badder than ever. Um, we figured out a way to generate a lot of revenue in a short amount of time and it saved the company. And today we're, you know, 10 times bigger than we were back then. But um, yeah, it was, it was pretty gnarly. It was pretty gnarly. So I don't think you can ever stick to your loyal, uh, your loyal stick to your, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, your laurels, excuse me, because, um, you know, things can happen, right? You have to be on top of everything in your business. You take the eye off, off the ball, you're going to have problems. So um, there were a lot of lessons to be learned there, I suppose, right? We were looking at revenue, not looking at customers. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah, that was, that was pretty hardcore. That was, that was uh, quite a lesson. So was there, was there somebody in there that helped whenever you started to notice that, Hey, we're, we're going down a bad road. 
this is getting gnarly fast. Was there somebody that stepped in and was like, Hey, I've seen this before. Or... No, no, that didn't happen. It wasn't until the shit had totally hit the fan. I fired the VP of sales and I brought our whole team together where the team really rallied together. Um, you know, what do they say? There's, there is no I in team, right? I couldn't have done it without the team. And it right. was definitely um, a testament to uh, their abilities. And they all, they saved the day. We rallied and pulled together and saved the day. And you're, this business is based in the Philippines, correct? Yeah, yeah. Today we're part, uh, last year we had a big merger. So we're part of a big conglomerate, thousands and thousands of employees on three continents. So, Oh, company. wow. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So what, what types of things does this, do they outsource? What types of well, things are it, they doing? You know, I, th I think this is something your audience would enjoy. So I'll explain that, but I'll kind of explain the the nucleus of, of the story because I think it's very interesting. There's a lot to be learned. So um, I started a company about 15 years ago called 123 Employee. And um, I like to think when entrepreneurs think about outsourcing, they think about 123. We built a global brand. Uh, but in the early days of 123 Employee, um, we were uh, doing outsourcing for entrepreneurs, so virtual assistant services. Today, we've really expanded into larger accounts like, uh, you know, contact center, call center business. But we still have, we still are identified in that space. We still do a lot of virtual assistant services for entrepreneurs. In the early days, though, entrepreneurs didn't know anything about it. We were way too early to market. So I always say you can always tell who the pioneers are because they're the ones with the arrows in their back. And, you know, people think that there's a lot of advantage to being first to market. I will tell you, there's way more disadvantages to being first to market because we literally were first to market. There was one other company and there was us and we were the bigger company. Um, but the problem is entrepreneurs needed what we offered, but they didn't want it because they didn't know about it. And Entrepreneurs are always trying to fill a need, but we really want to fill a want because, you know, look, I, I need to you know run on the treadmill more. Okay. But, but I will pay anything for what I want. If I want a new Ferrari, I will pay for that. Right. So, you know, people will pay anything for something they want. Um, so you want to sell into a want and entrepreneurs needed outsourcing, but they didn't want it yet because they didn't know it existed. It existed for big companies, but we were the first to bring it to market for small companies. So it was very challenging in the early days. Um, there were a couple of things going on. One is we were a US company doing business in the Philippines. Back then that was considered un-American. Okay. And we would get hate mail and hate calls on a daily basis. F you, F you, we're going to burn down your building. We're going to come kill you. It was, it was pretty gnarly. That's serious. It, it's a whole different world today, right? I mean, today you outsource, you just, you, you you work with wherever it makes sense, right? But but that was a different time. So there was that. And then also nobody knew about us. So I knew early on that if we wanted to have a market, we'd have to somehow carve out that market. So I tried to figure out what, what we would do. And in the end, we ended up adopting an educational model. I started writing books, eventually became a New York Times bestselling author. My 10th book is out now. Uh started creating info products. I started speaking on stages globally. We started doing our events globally, US, Europe, Asia, New Zealand, um, um, and UK. Um, and we started doing webinars. And I began, well, there were a couple, okay. So that was a big shift. Well, first we, we started using, using that info mo marketing model and we began educating our prospects and turning them into clients, which is still a model that we use today in all our businesses. Um, so that was a tipping point for us. Another tipping point for us in our business was when Tim Ferriss's book came out, the four hour work week, you know, the book, right? Yep. Okay. So that was a big game changer, you know, for a lot of people, but for us, it was a real game changer because now all of a sudden we went from being public enemy number one to being the bell of the ball. Everybody wanted to do business with us. We were like, you know, the, the hot girl buying their freedom. Exactly. And so that was a huge tipping point for us. The hate mail stopped when Tim Ferriss's book came out. So that really helped us out. Um, so tipping point one was actually that. Tipping point two was was when I we started doing this educational model. What, what was a net result of that is we went from speaking to one to speaking to many. Most businesses market one to one. But in an info marketing model, you're marketing 
you're you're speaking one to many. Your podcast is one to many. You're going to do this one time with me, and lots of people are going to listen to it, right? right? If I do a webinar, hundreds of people are on it. If I speak at an event, there might be a thousand people in the room. If we do one of our own events, there's a couple hundred people. If I write a book, over a hundred thousand people will read that book, or hundreds of thousands. And that was a huge tipping point in our business because our business began to grow exponentially when that happened. So that was another big tipping point in our business. Now, at this point, when this started to happen and the business began to snowball, I think I had a couple hundred employees, um, but there was only one of me. So I had a lot of uh, task executors, but no strategists. And there were a myriad of different things that I knew would move the needle in my business if only I had more of me. So then I brought on my first C-level executive, um, my VP, Bijal, and then our business really you know, start taking off. Um, so yeah, so there were a lot of tipping points, points in the business um, and they all, you know, definitely were valuable lessons along the way. You, you said that when you were a kid, you had a roadmap of what your future was going to be. Did you imagine at 13, 14, 15, that this is the life that you were going to create? Was that even a thought in your mind? No, no. I mean, I think I had, I had big dreams, but I didn't know it would turn out as cool as it did. Yeah. I did. I mean, it, it, I, I'll give you an example. Like I always wanted to live on the water. I have two homes on the water. You know, um, I, I never thought that would be possible. You know, I just, yeah. Uh, all the stuff that happened. I, 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 I just had this almost kind of blind belief and hunger, but, um, but I didn't think it would turn out as cool as it did. So whenever you got into writing, you're sitting down to write your first book or you're getting ready to start speaking to audiences of, you know, large groups of people. Was there ever a time that you questioned, am I qualified to do this? Who, who am I and why the hell would anybody want to listen to me talk? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you remind me of a really good story. So when we started, um, remember I said one of the marketing vehicles for our business is we started doing events globally where we would educate our prospects and turn them in, we would turn them into clients. Well, there were two byproducts of that. So one is we were selling people into one, two, three employee for our outsourcing services, but we also sold, sold coaching. And I sold a high level mastermind where people work with me on an immersion level uh, on an annual basis. We get together several times a year at my house in a small group. And I think we charged initially we charged thirty five thousand a year for that, and um, and we we knew that initially we were going to sell that from stage at our events. So I remember it was our first event, and Bijal, my VP, and I we were working till midnight, working on that presentation, working on that pitch, and we we had to get some sleep because the next day you know, was day two of the event. And I remember I turned to Bijal, you know, we're, we're kind of wrapping up the presentation. And I look at him and I said, I said, who is going to buy this? Who's going to buy this $35,000 program? And he goes, I don't know. I don't know. You know, because you don't know your value. Right. You know, you don't know what people are willing to pay for access to you, right? Based on yeah. what you have offer right no we i think we all undervalue ourselves so the next day i did the pitch and they went running to the back of the room and we sold that out you know and that was the beginning really? absolutely now it's it's a different kind of sale so they go running to the back of the room they fill out applications and then we we met with them and decided who we wanted to work with but but yeah we, we crushed it crushed it and that was the beginning of a new channel of income for us and what i like about that i'm not into coach. I'm definitely not into one-on-one -on -one coaching at all. Um, I do enjoy group coaching. Um, I enjoy it for a lot of reasons. Um, it challenges me. It challenges me. There's nothing I like better than kind of hanging out with entrepreneurs and exchanging ideas. It's just fun for me. Um, so I love it. I love cocktails. I love food. So, you know, we, it, we do all this together, right? We break bread, but we also work together. Um, but also from a financial standpoint, um, coaching is kind of cool because it, I think it just rep represented a couple million bucks a year for our business, which was not a lot in the big scheme of things, but the margin was like 70%, which is, you know, much higher than our regular business, which is like 20%. So, um, 
so I really enjoyed it and it was worthwhile. It was profitable. Um, and we ran that program for a decade and, um, and I met some really unbelievable entrepreneurs and we helped them create some, some really big companies, which I'm very proud of. So, so it was pretty neat. Pretty that's neat. In, but, that's but incredible. That, and it sounds like you guys actually did provide some serious value to, to the people that invested. Yeah, we we help people explode their businesses. It was really quite astounding. I mean, not everybody you know had it on that level, but we had some businesses that had just unbelievable success. And uh, but yeah, that, that that night we're like, who's gonna buy this? Like I'm like, who who's gonna buy this? Because I was like, I don't know. Who, I have no idea. I, I, who knows? <laughs> but they bought it. So there you go. You you know, you really don't know your your true value. So yeah. No, I've, yeah. I've been kicking around the idea of writing a book and I figure this podcast getting to have conversations with people like you that are, you know, you've accomplished so much. I, I really started this so I could have the roadmap for myself so I can role model this for my son because I have a 14 year old son and I would love nothing more than for him to avoid making all of the same mistakes that I did because I was not a driven person for a good most of my life. You know, it's yeah. really just been a couple of years now. Interesting. Yeah, I was always hyper driven, super driven. But, you know, I went to the school of hard knocks. So I was a college dropout. Um, you know, my business took off in, in that first year. So I ended up dropping out and, and building my businesses. Um, but yeah, with my kids, you know, same thing, like, you know, I, I, I try to to give them as much knowledge as possible. I, I don't want them to have to make the same mistakes. You know, I always say that no matter what you want to do, no matter what idea you have, there's always somebody that's walked before you. Right. And if you latch onto them, they'll get you there faster, right? There's a shortcut for everything. Um, and mentorship is one of the biggest shortcuts that exists on the planet, right? And so, um, yeah, you know, I, I try to do the same things with my kids and it, it's neat because the stuff they do adopt, they really get a head start on. Like I'm, I'm helping them invest. My kids are 21 and 22. You know, if they stick to the plan, you know, they will be a millionaire in, in 10 years in their early thirties, you know, if they don't come up with some big tech thing in the meantime, and neither of my kids are super entrepreneurial. So it's a whole different trip with them, but then there's the stuff they don't listen to and you just have to watch them fall on their asses, you know, but, um, and that's but part of the learning process too. It is. It is. I have to it remind is. myself of that because I'm like, I just spelled this out for you, bro. And we're going. I know. <laughs> you know it's, it's interesting because when you hit your 20s, you know everything, right? And it's not till you're about 28 that you realize you don't know anything, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's funny, my daughter, I really conditioned her for this when she was in her tweens. I started telling her, I said, "Listen, you're gonna, you know, get into your teens and early 20s." And you're going to think that you know everything, but you're really just an idiot. Okay. Told her. <laughs> okay. Uh, I said, you're going to think you know everything, but you're really just an idiot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was like a, a joke, but, but she, she gets it now. She's like, you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll check her. I'll be like, you know, you think, you know, it. she's like, I know, but I don't know shit. Like, exactly. So listen, you know, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's kind of funny, kind of funny, but, um, but books, I will tell you this. So, uh, probably the single greatest thing I ever did for any of my businesses was writing books and becoming a bestseller, top tier bestseller. Um, that changed everything for me. And, and by the way, I'm looking over here because I normally have a stack of my books around. I could show you some books and give you some, uh, uh, I could kind of share some insights on, on how they work and what have you. Matter of fact, you want me to grab some books? If you want, yeah. Yeah, let me see if I can find them. Hang on. I bet you've never had one of your guests just walk away for a second. Hang on. I actually have. Have you? Okay, good. Good. All right. Let's see. Books. Okay, here's some of my books. So, uh, my very first book, which I think is a really valuable lesson if you're looking to write a book. So, my first book was a book called Outsource Smart. Is that right? No. Outsource this. Outsource the, I was going to say, I looked that one up. Yeah. Outsource this was the first book. And that book, um, I call it my Citizen Kane. You ever see the movie Citizen Kane? Yep. Okay. For those of you out there that don't know Citizen Kane, Citizen Kane was written, uh, directed, and starred um, uh, Orson Welles, who played um, Citizen Kane, which is loosely 
actually very closely written around. Um, I mean, it was definitely William Randolph Hearst, who was um, uh, one of the richest people uh, in the world at the turn of the century. He owned the uh, Hearst newspaper um, company. And uh, that was the media of the day. He was like the Rupert Murdoch of the day. Anyways, um, he did this movie. It was fictional, but it was really William Randolph Hearst. And when he made the movie, it was considered the greatest movie ever made. Um, and even, you know, almost a century later, it's still considered one of the greatest movies ever made. And he, he was amazing in it. He directed it. He started it. Brilliant. He spent the rest of his life chasing that. Never had a hit like Citizen Kane. How could he? It was the greatest film ever made. Um, so uh, Outsource This, not that that was the greatest book ever written, but it was my most successful book of 10 books. And, and here's why. So I wrote the book and we were selling it for like $17.95. And obviously it was called Outsource This. So what, what did I want to sell? Obviously more outsourcing services. And we were selling it for $17.95. And several months in, one day I woke up, I have my best ideas when I'm sleeping. I, I woke up and I'm like, why are we selling this book? What do I care about making $18? I said, I want outsourcing clients, which which generate revenue of you know, 500 a month to 10, 20, 30, 50,000 a month at the time now a couple hundred thousand a month so so why you know why do i care about selling a book so we just start giving the book away and we gave away hundreds of thousands of copies in print and ebooks and audiobooks and made tens of millions of dollars so that was financially my most successful book why because we just gave it away because so many authors lose sight of why they're an author if you are writing books to sell millions and millions of books and make, you know, lots of, you know, millions and millions of two bucks a book or 10 bucks a book, uh, 15 if it's self-published. Um, the odds of that happening for you are, are, are unlikely. You have a better chance of winning the lottery, but you can certainly make millions from your book. That was a book that was giving away. And we made millions and millions of dollars from that book. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's brilliant. Absolutely. So anytime I write a book, I always think with, I always think about the end in mind. Okay, what, what do I want to achieve with this book? And then I build a funnel accordingly. So that first one was to sell outsourcing services. This is my second book. This one became a New York Times bestseller. This changed everything for me. So clever title, right? Outsource this, outsource smart, now stupid title. But I wanted to call this book Living the Laptop Lifestyle. But this book was on McGraw, McGraw Hill, one of the top publishers. And when you're on a major publisher, you have no control. So they, they picked the name. I fought them on it for a while. But then, you know, hey, people support what they create. In the end, they did not support this book, but it still became a New York Times bestseller. That was all me and my team. Um, and this book, uh, my goal with it was to hit the New York Times bestseller list. That was my intention. Why? It was a positioning play. I was speaking on entrepreneurial stages. So I knew that there were that there'd be people in the audience that would be worth a couple million dollars a year to me in the C-suite because these were larger enterprise level companies. So this was a positioning play. I figured if I hit the New York Times bestseller, bestsellers list, then those doors would open for me. And they did. Um, this is kind of cool. So this one is the audio book of Outsource Smart, which is funny because it's CDs, right? There's no CDs anymore. You're looking at that little this like, what the hell heck is that? But uh, anyways, this was great because I had that deal with McGraw Hill, but they left out accidentally um the audio rights so we sold hundreds of thousands of copies gave away hundreds of thousands of copies of this and generated a ton of business without paying mcgraw hill that was neat um let's see what else uh oh this is kind of cool when you have a major publishing deal like one day i got this book in the mail and i get a lot of books in the mail uh, i have friends that are authors but also people send me books to review or and or write forwards for it and but usually there's a note there was a there's no note it was just a book and it was in another language and it looked like Spanish, but I understand Spanish. I did not understand this. And then I realized it was Portuguese and I saw my name on it. So they start putting out your book in different languages, which is pretty cool. It turns out Outsource Smart was a big hit in Brazil and Portugal. So that's kind of cool. Um, you know, I, I write a lot of books on business. Most of my books are nonfiction, um, but I do write an inspirational book series called Lessons from Beyond about people who passed away and le lessons that they pass on to the living. Um, okay. It's just because I enjoy doing it, but <clears throat> an amazing example of where books uh, yeah. take you. I'll tell you a quick story. I know we're running low on time, but it's pretty cool. So for each book of lessons, I interview people from all walks of life. 
somebody that was in their life that passed away. They share with me the story, any, any lessons or lessons they glean from that person's life or death, and then I craft the story. Well, my, my uncle, another one of my uncles, my uncle Roy was the speechwriter to Prime Minister Diefenbaker in the 70s in Canada. And when my uncle Roy died at the funeral, Prime Minister Brian Milroney showed up and read the eulogy. They were friends. Uh, that was pretty neat. Years and years go by, I start writing lessons. And I started thinking to myself, I said, I wonder if um, the prime minister would do an interview with me about my uncle Roy. So I reach out to the prime minister's office. I tell them the story and they say, well, we'll, we'll ask the prime minister and get back to you. So a couple months go by. I don't hear anything. One day I get a call from the prime minister's office and they said, yeah, the prime minister will do the interview with you. I said, oh, that's awesome. So we do the interview. And the prime minister tells me this amazing story of one day, my uncle Roy, he got in a knockdown drag out fight with Henry Kissinger and threw him up against the wall. Uh, that was awesome. It was a great story. So, so we wrap up the story. He said, okay. He said, uh, are you happy? I said, yeah, I'm super happy. He said, did you get what you want? Wanted? I said, yeah, it's great. He goes, okay, great. I have a favor to ask you. I said, what's that? Now at the time I was in the, in the business in Hollywood, I was producing music in television. He said, listen, I know you're in the, in the entertainment business. He said, we have a, a friend of the family and their daughter is looking to kind of break into the business in Hollywood. Is there anything you could do? I said, absolutely. I said, I can, I can get her uh, an agent for sure. He said, oh, that'd be wonderful. He said, uh, is there anything I could do for you? I said, well, you mentioned Henry Kissinger. I said, I'd love to get an interview with Henry Kissinger. He said, well, he said, listen, Henry's getting on now. He said, Henry's 85. He said, um, you know, I, I don't think he'd be that up to it. He said, I don't think he'd be a good interview for you. He said, is there anybody else? I said, uh, Bill Clinton. He goes, I'll make the call. So he calls Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton says, um, I'll do the interview. Um, now, at the time, uh, President Clinton was um, doing the Senate race for Hillary. And he said, I, he said, I'll do the interview. But he said, let me wrap up with, with Hillary's Senate race. And then he wrapped up. I'd already wrapped up the book, so I didn't follow through. But the following, a couple of years later, I he and I shared the stage to 6,000 people at the O2 Arena in London. So that was pretty neat. Uh, let's see. Anyways, I keep going on and on. This is my latest book that's in the bookstores right now. It's called The Virtual Entrepreneur. This is my first fiction book. It's a parable. Um, but uh, I do we have a couple more minutes. I can. I, I do. Yeah, talk about it, man. Let's do this real quick. So years ago, <clears throat> not years ago, maybe a year or two ago, I started an association called the Virtual Entrepreneurs Association. All the tools, resources, discounts. Um, uh, and um, and sort of a toolbox for for the virtual entrepreneur. And, and I created this just before COVID and then COVID hit and really took off. But just put all that in perspective because I have a big following now, which all came from books and 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 um, an and info marketing model. Day one, we had thousands of people join VIA, which is cool, the Virtual Entrepreneurs Association. So I wrote a book to kind of springboard this. Um, and every time I do this, I, I think of the funnel, what it's gonna look like, what it's gonna achieve. So um, this book's pretty interesting. We actually have what's called a co-publishing deal with Morgan James, which is another publisher. Morgan James does all the all the bookstores, and then we match it by doing the online. Um, and we do you know maybe a hundred thousand copies online, and then Morgan James does a hundred thousand copies, which is pretty cool. And um, and then for this, I, I created what I call a. Uh, perpetual funnel or per, uh, viral loop. I call it a viral loop. And it's pretty neat how it works. So um, for people that join VIA, they receive a membership kit. And in the membership kit is the 10th anniversary uh, edition of my book, which includes uh, a letter from me. Um, it comes with a, a membership card. It comes with the hardback version of my new book, The Virtual Entrepreneur. It comes with the Virtual Entrepreneur Success Journal. It's pretty neat. People uh, they get this when they sign up for VIA. It takes them through a funnel. Uh, there's some upsells and downsells. And then at the end, it says, hey, you want to send some of these out to your friends and people that you care about. Uh, just pay for the shipping. We manufacture these in China, so the shipping covers that. So it starts sending out more boxes. Those boxes offer a free membership to VIA. And so those people sign up and then the loop continues over and over again. People are, are in the bookstores. They see this as well, but there's a different version. It's the same box, but it has this on the cover because they don't know what VIA is yet. Uh, and then inside it comes with a free trial. So those people buy it in the stores and then that feeds them into our funnel. And then and then they start sending these out to their friends and the viral loop continues on and on. And it just continues to grow the brand. So anyway, it's just some of the ideas, some of the different things that we do with books. 
pretty neat. Uh, I will tell you one last thing. Last year we started a publishing company called Michael's Press. Uh, you know, after a decade of writing books, I got offered a, a distribution deal, which was cool. And we do um, multi-author books. And because I have such a big following now, my books automatically hit Wall Street Journal bestsellers. Status. So all of our co-authors become Wall Street Journal bestsellers. It's pretty neat. That's awesome. So, um, that's one of the things we offer from Michael's Press, which is awesome. So yeah, we have a lot of things going. And, um, you know, today, I guess the big shift for me, like you said earlier, you know, I only work on today what I'm wildly passionate about, not what I have to do. So, mm -hmm. shift. but it took a long time to get here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know we're real short on time. I do have just a few more. I have lots of questions that I look forward to asking you when I am cruising with you yes, out of still, Puerto Rico. Yeah, I'm like excited fun. about that. But um, I wanted to ask you about fitness and how you, you, you appear to be a very fit guy. I haven't heard anything noted about it, but do you, do you have any kind of morning workout routine? Do you have a fitness regimen that you feel like plays into your success or your energy level? Yeah. No, for me, it's fitness first. Um, you know, Tony Robbins kind of drove that home to me a long time ago. Um, you know, he, he puts his health first and, uh, I was exposed to that God 20 years ago from Tony and that made perfect sense to me, right? Because if you don't have your health, you have nothing. So health, health is first. Um, I like to eat, uh, I enjoy a cocktail here and there. Uh, I like a cigar here and there too. So, um, you know, I may not be the best eater in the world, but I work out every day. I just, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So that that's always been easy because I just really enjoy it. Um, but it's always uh, physical first. So I'll take the time out for myself before everything else. Okay. And then one that's, last that's, that's the first thing for me. And I do like to hike at the end of the day, though, just for fun. Yeah. So one last final thought for my listeners. What what is something that you would leave my listeners with? Sure. Well, actually, I want to I want to pitch him on something real quick because I think this is really important. You mentioned it, but we didn't even touch on this. So, um, you know, I love to build communities. It's one of my favorite things. My my community today is about a million and a half wide. But I moved to Puerto Rico five years ago, and and if you're watching this, you may not know about our amazing tax laws we have in Puerto Rico, but if you're a U.S. citizen, you jump through some legal hoops and you make Puerto Rico your actual home, um, we pay almost no taxes. So 4% uh, federal income tax, 0% capital gains, 0% dividends. It's, uh, it's a real game changer. Um, and so I came here for the tax break and fell in love with the culture, the people, the weather, the natural beauty. It's a wonderful place. But wherever I am, I'm always building community. Um, and, and I just do it because I love it. I'm passionate about it. I love people. I love hanging out, having cocktails, getting to know people, making deals. That's just my thing. But I also believe in this day and age, the, the age of the influencer and what have you, that building communities is just super important, super important. And there's a lot of power in building a community. So I built, I started a couple communities here and one of them I call the San Juan social club because, um, with San Juan's in Puerto Rico. That's our mm -hmm. major. And uh, and so it, it started off initially as a cigar club, and then we just broadened it out just for everyone to hang out. Cigars are uh, optional. And uh, in the early days, I moved here five months after Maria, after Hurricane Maria. So it was pretty, nobody was coming to Puerto Rico at the time. And so we get like five or six people that would show up for these events. Well, now we have almost a thousand people in the community. And, uh, and so we do big events uh, once a month um, at curated locations across the island. And my goal with the San Juan Social Club was literally one thing, to bring uh, Puerto Ricans that grew up here together with transplants, you know, so that we can all get along in harmony. And that was it. Uh, no ulterior motive, primarily free events. Um, I just wanted us all to be united. Um, but I figured, you know, that there would be something, something bigger someday, but I, I didn't know what. Well, um, April 13th of next year is the very first San Juan Social Club cruise. And it's for Puerto Ricans and people that want to learn about Puerto Rico's amazing resources and opportunities, network, have fun, and uh and it's going to be super awesome. Uh, this is a uh, a tried and true uh, event that I've actually been a part of for a decade. So I've had the privilege for the last decade of speaking on a cruise called the Marketers Cruise, which is all the top marketers from all over the globe. And we've been doing it for the last decade. And I'm taking that model and bringing it to Puerto Rico 
to help promote Puerto Rico and and make more you know friends globally of Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans. And uh, so anyways, it's going to be super awesome. We announced it last week. We've already had almost 100 people sign up for the cruise. And if you're watching this and you want to hang out with some amazing people, we have you know billionaires, super successful people, uh, a lot of incredible speakers, uh, a lot of movers and shakers like Jeff. And uh, it's going to be super fun. You're going to learn a lot about Puerto Rico, but you're just going to have a blast on the hottest cruise line on the water, which is Virgin. On the hottest brand new boat that's not even in the water yet, the uh, brand new Brilliant Lady. Uh, it's a super amazing ship. And uh, we, we have a um, uh, five-star or Michelin, Michelin star menu and uh, uh, all kinds of great events. It's going to be so fun. I'm so psyched about it. And I, I'm so psyched that the response has been so great. So uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. So if people want to cruise with us, hang out with Jeff, hang out with me, uh, we can make that happen. It'd be great. For sure. Yeah, that's that's how we found each other. My, my uncle Roger Best lives in Puerto Rico. He's now in yeah. Isla Verde, but he was, he was yeah, in Palmas was- Del Mar. That's right. And uh, a f- about two months ago, he sent me a, a link to an audio book for JLD, uh-huh. uh, the Uncommon Path to Common, the Common Path to Uncommon Success. And he's like, yeah. "Man, I just read this, and you are into podcasting." He's like, "You've got to read this book." Absolutely. So, for those of you that don't know, John Lee Dumas is uh, one of the top ten of all business podcasters. Um, he's hugely successful. He's the reason I moved to Puerto Rico. He's one of my neighbors here and dear friends, and he'll be speaking on the cruise as well. I am so pumped! I, I can't wait, man. I'm excited. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in April, man. Sounds great. Me too. Can't wait. All right. Have a good day, brother. See y'all.